Hi everyone, this lesson is on the condition known as myasthenia gravis. So myasthenia gravis is an acquired autoimmune condition involving neuromuscular blockade and subsequent muscle weakness. We're going to talk about this in more detail when we talk about the pathophysiology in the next slide. Myasthenia gravis is considered a type 2 hypersensitivity condition and it is the most common neuromuscular junction disorder affecting skeletal muscles. It is estimated to have a prevalence of 1 in 5,000 people, and this data comes from North America. And there are different age predispositions for this condition. So, for instance, female patients outnumber male patients with this condition below the age of 40. But after the age of 50, male patients outnumber female patients. So as a patient gets older, the age of onset will change depending on the patient. And this is roughly what will happen with patient characteristics who have this condition. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology behind why myasthenia gravis occurs. So as I mentioned before, it is an autoimmune condition and it involves autoantibodies being produced against acetylcholine receptors and other muscle components. So autoantibodies are antibodies that are produced against the patient's own tissues. So before we actually talk about what those antibodies do, let's talk about what's supposed to happen when a patient wants to contract one of their muscles. So if a patient wants to contract one of their muscles, they have motor neurons that contain acetylcholine neurotransmitter. So motor neurons contain vesicles of acetylcholine. So when a patient wants to contract one of their muscles, acetylcholine is released from the motor neuron and attaches to what are known as nicotinic acetylcholine receptors on the target muscle. The binding of acetylcholine to these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors leads to contraction of that particular muscle. However, in the case of myasthenia gravis, there are these antibodies that are formed against particular parts of this apparatus. So as I mentioned before, one of these autoantibodies is anti-acetylcholine receptor, so antibodies against this particular nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Another autoantibody that can be formed is anti-muscle specific kinase, and there are other autoantibodies that we will talk about later on when we talk about diagnosing this condition. Nevertheless, what will happen is that these autoantibodies will bind to the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors or other parts of the muscle, which will then prevent acetylcholine from binding to those receptors. So what essentially happens is in the case of anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies, those antibodies actually compete against acetylcholine for those acetylcholine receptors on the target muscle. And because of that, acetylcholine can't bind to those acetylcholine receptors, can't activate the target muscle. And this will lead to issues like muscle weakness and fatigue. Other autoantibodies can bind to other parts of the muscle, also preventing the proper contraction of that muscle. So ultimately those autoantibodies can lead to muscle weakness and fatigue. And the worst part of this is that as a patient goes through the day and continues to try to contract their muscles, their motor neuron will start to deplete acetylcholine neurotransmitter, leading to less and less acetylcholine being released and less competition for those autoantibodies. So those autoantibodies start to win the battle. So as the day goes on, the patient becomes weaker and weaker and has more muscle fatigue. This is going to be important when we talk about the signs and symptoms in the next upcoming slides. Now let's talk about those signs and symptoms. So now that we know the pathophysiology, we can better understand why we see fluctuating muscle weakness and fatigue of heavily used muscle groups. Heavily used muscle groups because those are the muscle groups that are going to utilize more acetylcholine and it's going to deplete those motor neurons. So what can often be noted is that the muscle weakness and fatigue worsens with activity and improves with rest. So what will be noted is that the weakness gets worse in the afternoon hours into the evening hours and is better in the morning. And there are particular muscle groups that are more commonly affected in myasthenia gravis, including the muscles of the eyes, the extremities, and the throat. And we're going to break it down and get into more specific details as to each of these muscle groups here in a moment. So the first group of muscles we're going to look at are the extraocular muscles. So they're going to be extraocular muscle weakness. So this can present as ptosis, which is drooping of the eyelid, and diplopia, which is double vision. So you can see here this is ptosis, so this would be unilateral ptosis, one-sided. And what's important about this ptosis and diplopia, or double vision, is that it is often not present in the morning. So a patient wakes up, they don't have ptosis or double vision, but as the day goes on into the afternoon and evening hours, they start to have ptosis and double vision. Again, as we mentioned before, the ptosis can be unilateral or bilateral. So if it is bilateral, both eyelids would be affected, both would be drooping, but oftentimes it's going to be asymmetric, meaning that one of them is going to droop more than the other. 
And these eye findings like ptosis and diplopia are often going to be the initial findings of myasthenia gravis, and they are often the most common symptoms. And they affect a majority of patients with myasthenia gravis anywhere from 50 to 85%. And what's important about these particular findings is that the patient may wake up and not have these symptoms. They may not have ptosis or diplopia, but as they go through the day, in the afternoon and evening hours, they can start to have drooping eyelids and double vision. If a patient wakes up with no ptosis and by the end of the day, they have severe ptosis or they can't even open their eyes, that very much increases the possibility that this patient suffers from myasthenia gravis. And patients who only have extraocular muscle weakness are considered to have what is called ocular myasthenia gravis. And oftentimes, a patient will start with ocular myasthenia gravis and over time will develop into a generalized myasthenia gravis where other muscle groups are affected. So this is often going to be how this condition progresses, ocular myasthenia gravis to generalized myasthenia gravis. So as this condition progresses, or in some patients who don't have ocular myasthenia gravis, they can also have limb weakness. What is noted with this limb weakness is that proximal muscles are affected more than distal muscles. And some patients may have isolated limb weakness, but this is going to be more rare. It's only going to account for about 5% of cases. And then other patients will have bulbar muscle weakness. So this is where muscles involved in speaking, chewing, and swallowing are affected. And in patients who have bulbar muscle weakness, they can have issues with slurred speech, nasal speech, difficulty swallowing, and chewing. And along with this, because of some weakness in these muscles, they can have an association with obstructive sleep apnea. And then in other cases, patients may have head and neck extension weakness. And with all of this muscle weakness, it is going to be painless. It's going to be a painless muscle weakness. And what can often occur is that this muscle weakness can be very mild, but over weeks to months, it can become more and more severe. And then in some patients, they can experience what is known as a myasthenic crisis. A myasthenic crisis is when there is weakness that affects respiratory muscles, leading to requirement of ventilatory assistance. And because of this, this can lead to increased risk of severe complications. Not all patients will get this myasthenic crisis. It's estimated that 15 to 20% of patients will experience a myasthenic crisis at some point in their life. And it's more common in the first two years of diagnosis. And it's more common in patients who have anti-muscle specific kinase antibodies. And because of that weakness affecting respiratory muscles and the requirement of ventilatory assistance, patients who have myasthenic crisis have an increased risk of mortality. So this is very important to recognize. And then there are particular exacerbating factors that increase the muscle weakness in patients and increase the risk of a myasthenic crisis. So some of these include infection, chronic conditions like diabetes, surgery, warm weather or hot temperatures, certain medications, stress, pregnancy, and menstruation. So all of these are factors that can increase the severity of symptoms of myasthenia gravis and increase the risk of having a myasthenic crisis. And there are actually five types or five classes of myasthenia gravis from one to five, one being the least severe and five being the most severe. So class one is when there is ocular muscle weakness with normal muscle function. So we mentioned before that most patients will start out with having extraocular muscle weakness and then will progress to generalized myasthenia gravis or muscle weakness of other muscle groups, including muscles of their extremities. However, some patients will remain in class one. They will remain with ocular myasthenia gravis, and this is roughly 15 to 25% of patients. So most patients will move on into having more generalized muscle weakness. So class two is where there is mild generalized muscle weakness with or without ocular muscle weakness. So we mentioned before that some patients may have generalized myasthenia gravis or have limb weakness without ocular muscle weakness. So this could occur in some patients. Class three is where there is moderate generalized muscle weakness with or without ocular muscle weakness. Class four is where there is severe generalized muscle weakness with or without ocular muscle weakness. And then class five is where they require intubation. So these are the five classes of myasthenia gravis. Let's talk about how clinicians diagnose myasthenia gravis. So some clinicians may diagnose myasthenia gravis clinically, but most times blood work is going to be performed to look out for some of those autoantibodies we talked about before. So as mentioned before, anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies can lead to myasthenia gravis. So if anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies are found, this is highly specific to myasthenia gravis, and it's around 100% specific. And these anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies are more likely to occur in those with generalized myasthenia gravis compared to patients who only have ocular myasthenia gravis. 
in false positive results for these particular antibodies can occur in some patients, including those with a thymoma, those with Lambert-Eaton syndrome, those with small cell lung carcinoma, and those patients over the age of 70. Another important antibody to look out for with myasthenia gravis is anti-muscle specific kinase or anti-musk antibody. We talked about anti-muscle specific kinase antibody being the antibody that increases the risk of a myasthenic crisis episode. Some other autoantibodies include anti-LRP4 antibody, anti-agrin antibody, anti-cortactin antibody, and anti-striated muscle antibodies. All of these, again, are going to affect muscle function leading to those signs and symptoms we talked about before. And anti-striated muscle antibodies are more likely to occur in those with concomitant thymomas. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about some treatment methods. Continuing with the diagnosis, in patients who are seronegative, so even if the patient has had blood work done and none of those autoantibodies have been found, some other tests can be performed to see whether or not a patient has myasthenia gravis. And one of them is what is called a repetitive nerve stimulation or a single fiber electromyography. Imaging can also be performed in patients who are suspected of having myasthenia gravis, so plain chest radiographs can be performed. This is going to look for a thymoma, which is an anterior mediastinal mass. So it's a growth or an enlargement of the thymus gland. So when you can see in this image here, this is an enlarged thymoma. A CT scan can also be performed as well to look out for a thymoma. So you can see here is a thymoma in this image. An MRI brain and eye orbit can also be performed to rule out mass lesions. So if a patient is having some ptosis or double vision, this can help rule out some other possible causes. And then once a clinician has diagnosed myasthenia gravis, how do they treat it? So medications that are often used to treat myasthenia gravis include anticholinesterase inhibitors. Anticholinesterase is an enzyme that actually breaks down acetylcholine. So in the space between the motor neuron and the target muscle, there are enzymes that break down that acetylcholine. So using these medications, so these anticholinesterase inhibitor medications, you can stop that process and lead to an increased level of acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. So some of these include peridostigmine. So peridostigmine can be used for maintenance. And neostigmine can be used when peridostigmine is unavailable. IVIG may also be used by clinicians. So this is IV immunoglobulin G. Vivgart can also be another medication clinicians may use. And then in some cases, there can be immunosuppression agents that are used, including prednisone, azathioprine, methotrexate, mycophenolate, mofletil, tacrolimus, cyclosporin, and cyclophosphamide. And then some other possible treatment methods include plasmapheresis. And then surgery. And in the case where a patient has a thymoma, for instance, this can be important as patients could undergo a thymectomy or removal of the thymus gland. And in some patients, this may actually be curative. So this is also important to recognize and think about as well. So again, medications used for myasthenia gravis include anticholinesterase inhibitors, IVIG, Vivgart, and some immunosuppression agents like prednisone, some steroid sparing medications, which are important, including azathioprine, methotrexate, and others. And then another possible method of treatment is plasmapheresis. And then in patients with thymomas, a thymectomy or removal of the thymus gland may be curative in some patients. Hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please like subscribe for more lessons like this one. And thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.